Okay, before we begin our unit on evolution, this is Harry, the guinea pig of science. He just bit me. His favorite scientist is Charles Darwin. He told me so. All right, he doesn't like it here. And definitely not. Grace, you have to take <laughs> Harry now. You um, So, uh, at any rate, we are about to start our unit on evolution by natural selection. The guinea pig was not totally inappropriate because they are native to South America and uh, Charles Darwin did a lot of his work in South America. So there you go. Um, there we go. Uh, what we need to do is start with Darwin's ideas about how evolution change over time could occur and that is the process of natural selection. Um, so what he said was that organisms over reproduce, meaning a given organism is gonna make more offspring than it can support, um, that then can be supported by the environment. Um, uh, that is because the environment of course has limited resources. Uh, so, once that is put into play, competition is going to result uh, because of those limited resources and so many offspring in the environment. He also said that not all of the organisms in a given population are going to be identical. Uh, variety exists, and much of that variety is inheritable. And in fact, in evolution, that is the only variety that we care about, is that variety that is inheritable, those characteristics that are inheritable that you can pass on to the next generation. Um, some difference in your appearance or your phenotype that you might acquire while you are alive, uh, a tattoo on your arm doesn't count because you can't pass it on to your offspring. Now, due to this variety that exists between individuals, some of these individuals are going to be better at obtaining those limited resources, avoiding predation, whatever, than others. And so there will be differential survival. Some will survive, some won't. And because there will be differential survival, uh, differential um, success at living and getting resources, those um, organisms that survive and thrive the best will leave more offspring than those that struggle or that, of course, die. And this is called differential reproductive success. Not everybody is going to leave the same amount of offspring. Okay, so successful organisms with adaptations uh, that are excellent are able to reproduce and have offspring that inherit those very adaptations and so on. Okay, so over reproduction, competition, variety, and I should insert there hered heredity, inheritance of that variety, differential survival, differential reproduction, and inheritance of those beneficial characteristics. That's, those are all at the crux of what Darwin said. And if you had to distill all that down even further to one sentence, uh, one phrase, differential reproductive success is what it's all about for natural selection as Darwin explained it. Now, what led Darwin to his conclusions? Uh, certainly, his ideas seem to stem back to his voyage aboard uh, the Beagle, a uh, British ship from, for about five years, and you see here its path from England down the coast of South America and around, and then a very long way back to England. Um, the goal of this voyage was to map and study the South American coastline, about which little was known. Uh, so, in particular, what Darwin really got his wheels turning was as uh, his, of course, of observations he made all along the coast of South America, but then the comparisons he made to this little set of volcanic islands off the coast of South America, and those, of course, of course are the Galapagos Islands. Um, again, uh, volcanic in origin. And here they are, I can't even see them because the lines are in the way there. Um, uh, 
most animal species on the Galapagos live nowhere else on the planet except there. But what Darwin noticed is that they do seem to resemble species that lived on the South American mainland and that he had saw, seen in his travels there. And they resemble the organisms living on the South American mainland more than they resembled species living anywhere else in the world. And that included other similar islands, other volcanic islands in similar climates. And so Darwin's puzzle was, why do the organisms living here match more closely these living, those living in South America when there are other islands elsewhere on the planet that seem more similar to these? And if God specially created organisms for this island, why, why do they seem to resemble those? Is there a, a more... Um, uh, natural explanation for that. And so what Darwin began to think was that it was as though the islands had been colonized by plants and animals that had somehow strayed from the South American mainland. Maybe they had been blown off course or uh, seeds had been windblown or floated or whatever. Um, and once these organisms got to these islands, uh, they diversified uh, to the different microclimates on these different islands. So an example that is often that, that, that Darwin noticed, not really until after he came back uh, to England with all of the uh, specimens he collected, um, he had collected many different, what he thought were many, many different types of birds, different species of birds. Uh, and what he had thought was he had found 13 very different kinds while he had been there. He thought he had found perhaps a finch, perhaps a sparrow, perhaps a woodpecker, perhaps a warbler based on their appearance. What he found when he returned back to England and had uh, his friend who was a bird expert look at these organisms what, was what he had actually found were not many di wildly different species, but many different types of finch. He had found 13 different species, but they were all finches. They weren't these wildly different groups. And they appeared to differ mostly in the type of beak they possessed. And the type of beak seemed particularly adapted to the type of food that was available in the different little microclimates of each particular island. Uh, you can see here he's got a species, the large ground finch that's got a really big beak, the small ground finch with a much smaller beak, a woodpecker finch, a warbler finch, all differing in, in uh, how their beaks seem to fit the type of food available on different islands. So, what Darwin had also noticed was that there was really only one type of finch, one type of finch on the whole South American mainland. So it appeared to him that the finch, that one finch species from South America, the mainland, had colonized an island on the Galapagos chain at some point in history. And over time, that one species of bird had colonized other islands and gradually become specialized to uh, take advantage of the particular foods on the, each of those different islands. So he thought that small populations of the original South American finch landed, variation in their beaks, naturally occurring inheritable variation in their beaks enabled some of those individuals to gather food more successfully in those different environments than other individuals. Those that didn't have a well-suited beak didn't survive. Those that had the better suited beaks survived better. Uh, and then they reproduced and passed on their better beaks to their offspring and so on and so on and so on. So over many, many generations, these populations of finches changed not only in their anatomy and their beak structure, but also perhaps behaviorally so that they acted in different ways. And over time, 
This led to the accumulation of advantageous traits in the population for the particular place where each one was living. Okay? And that led to the emergence of different species. Eventually, these different species were so, these different birds were so different from each other that even if they were reintroduced back together, they didn't breed together. And that's how we kind of determine if a species is present or not, if they can interbreed or not. So uh, since Darwin's time, lots and lots and lots of studies have been done about Darwin's finches. Um, and even more have been discovered. And this is a phylogenetic tree, a family tree, a phylogeny, if you will, showing the ancestral finch from the South American mainland and how that finch diversified into all the different species of finch on the Galapagos today. Okay. Uh, another example of what Darwin saw on those islands was the Galapagos tortoises, and it's a very similar uh, scenario to the finches. Uh, the, uh, the tortoises could be told, you could look at them and tell if they were from a dry island or from a, a, a rainy island based on their necks. The animals on the rainy islands tended to have shorter necks. The ones on the drier islands tended to have long necks that allowed them to reach uh, leafy uh, material from higher up when there wasn't any on the ground. Um, and um, again, Darwin thought that these islands had been populated by basically uh, the same sort of tortoise, but over many, many, many years, had, these tortoises had diversified to survive on the particular island climate where they where they lived okay now darwin didn't call evolution evolution he termed it descent with modification um, he used this term in place of evolution uh, the reason he used this term is he perceived that all life was unified uh, with all organisms related to each other through descent from some unknown ancestor that lived way, way, way in the very remote past. So as the descendants of that first organism um, diversified into various habitats, moved into various habitats over millions of years, they accumulated modifications, differences, uh, and adaptations that fit their very specific ways of life in their particular habitats, okay? This is a, uh, this tree is a great illustration of Darwin's thought. Uh, the ancestor would be here at the trunk and then branching out from that original ancestor would be the major uh, groups of living things with each living species today out here on one of these live twigs out here at the end, okay? So the history of life is like a branching tree and the trunk represents what all life has in common and its most ancient common ancestor. Um, so if we look at this uh, actual phylogeny of uh, some mammals, uh, different types of cats, um, in a phylogeny, what you're seeing is that each fork um, represents a meeting place right there where there was once a common ancestor, for example, between the domestic cat and the European wild cat, and they fairly recently share a common ancestor. Um, now, further back, way far back, our domestic cat shares a common ancestor with uh, an ocelot, okay? Um, and more recently than that, our domestic cat shares a common ancestor with a bobcat, and more recently than that still with a cheetah and a cougar. Um, so that's kind of how these work. Um, way further back, your domestic cat actually shares some common ancestor with jaguars, lions, leopards, and tigers. So the, the nexus points indicate common ancestry and how far away they are from the current living species indicates how far long ago they were related. Okay, so closely related species like lions and tigers share characteristics because they... Uh, their lineage extends 
to the smallest branches here, okay? That common ancestor, and there's a common ancestor, and there's a common ancestor. Obviously, these two are more closely related than the jaguar and the leopard, okay? And again, that's how this phylogeny of Darwin's finches is working as well, all right? So, uh, most branches, interestingly, uh, in the evolutionary tree of life, are dead ends, meaning those organisms have gone extinct. About 99% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. Uh, but the diversity we see uh, exists because those ancestors once lived and gave rise to what is currently living among us. So that explains why um, there are no living animals to fill the gaps between certain organisms that we see living today. For example, the elephants and their nearest living relatives today are a hyrax and a manatee. Now let's look at this. So here are our elephants over here, and here is a manatee, and a hyrax looks really like totally nothing like an elephant or a manatee. It's this little almost rodent looking furry thing. Um, but if we could see these extinct relatives that no longer are with us, these are kind of our our links to from from this guy way over here to these guys over here. But because they're gone, we don't really see the connection between them. We have to kind of look at fossils and try to piece things together. Okay. Uh, interestingly, uh, Linnaeus's classification system, and Linnaeus came many, many years before Darwin, uh, probably more than a century before Darwin, um, and he did not believe in evolution. His, he, Linnaeus, if you'll remember, was the father of our classification system. He gave us kingdom, phylum, class, order, uh, and the binomial nomenclature system, the two-name naming system. Um, but to Darwin, the hierarchy that Linnaeus put in place of this kingdom, phylum, class, and all of that reflected that branching genealogy of the tree of life. The animal kingdom would be one of the main big branches at the bottom, and then the different phyla coming off of that all the way out to the different species at the ends of the twigs. Okay? Um, so... Um, yeah, organisms at the different taxonomic levels, like uh, order and family, were related because of their descent from common ancestors um, back in the past. Okay, so just remember um, Darwin's ideas, um, inheritable variation over repro repro reproduction of offspring, competition, differential survival, um, differential reproduction. Please know what an adaptation is, and we get to stop here. So thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next podcast. Take care.